Welcome, everybody. This is uh, Real Estate Talk TGIF episode 313, which means it's 309 weeks in a row that we have been doing this. We're, we're really excited about everything we do, and we always have great, great people on, and today is no different. That's true. Here we are. We are with the Align team here in northern New Jersey, and we are here to help as many agents grow their business as possible. And that's really what we want to do. It's just about, it's about helping agents. And that's what Real Estate Talk TGIF is about. As I mentioned, this is episode 313, 309 weeks in a row. We've had extra episodes, a couple of those with John Cheplak, Tom Ferry, and Brent Gove, I believe was, was, an, was a, an additional one. But anyway, here we are. I said we are in Hawaii today. Next week, we'll be in New Jersey. And after that, we're going to be in Paris and we're going to be in Italy. How about that? We're traveling all over the world to do these things, but I'm so psyched today. I've got I've got Dylan to knock. As I said, number one TV XP in Hawaii, number three nationwide. A lot of things about you really like really get me all psyched and passionate about what we're doing, as I always am. Discipline equals freedom. This is the saying and statement that you have used and I've seen. You know, I want to talk about different things today. You've been involved in so many things, politics, military, all these things. And thank you so much for your service. And here we are. But it's all about real estate, man. To get started, I got one question for you, and then we're going to ask you another one. Tell me, what does TGIF stand for? It's a trick question. Well, the, the, the traditional definition is, thank goodness it's Friday, right? <laughs> that is true. That's true. I, I've heard that, but that's not what we're talking about. All right. What are we talking about? <laughs> it's thank God it's finale. Here we are. Dave there finale. Is, Michael, Dave. Even better. It's, all, it's all about us, man. Here we go. <laughs> Dylan, you've been in the business a while. You've done a few other things. Tell me what? Tell me about your journey and and where you started, you know, from maybe, I don't know, maybe there's not many people that go into high school, come out of high school, want to be a real estate agent or a college. What was your journey like? What, where did you come from to get to where you are today? Yeah, that was definitely the case for me. Um, I grew up here where I do business now in, in on the west side of the Big Island. And uh, my mom had actually gotten into real estate right when I was about to graduate high school. So I didn't get to benefit from the, from the, her successful real estate career because I was post my high school years. But uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do after high school. So um, I didn't want to get stuck here working construction or in a hotel, which is kind of what kids do when they graduate. There's, that's kind of the main industries. And right. I, at the time, didn't have the resources and didn't really like school very much. And I didn't want to have to go to college. And so I did the, the next best option, which was join, join the Marine Corps. I had an uncle that was in the Marines for like 25 years at the time and my mom my mom's brother and so he sent a recruiter to come talk to me and I just signed up I didn't have a grand plan it was just seemed like a good third option and like many things in my life ended up being one of the best decisions that I made even though it was kind of an accident you know just learn just develop so much in those four years learned about leadership learned about hardship uh ended that served ended my service with the invasion of Iraq it was I joined in 99 so it was a very you know peace time for 20 years and uh that wasn't you know going to war wasn't really a thing that was on on the horizon but uh everybody knows what happened in 2001 and I was part of the the first forces to cross into Iraq and, to, and into Baghdad later in the campaign and so that was in in March of 03 and then I ended up my enlistment was done in in August so I came home right after right after we came home from Iraq and then I went to college. At that point, I had the GI Bill. So I went into college and that was a great experience. I met my wife during that time and got into Hawaii government. I went through through state or through college politics. I got involved in the student government. I got involved in state government and that ended up leading to a job working for the governor after college. And I did that for, for three years. And that led to a job working at the in the Honolulu City Council for a couple of years. And then I got into, into consulting and, and uh, managing campaigns and did that for like 10 years and was relatively unsuccessful. I mean, it's some measure, you know, from, from, from an outcome standpoint, I think the input standpoint, we were doing the right things and we we're fighting the good fight, but was relatively unsuccessful in the grand scheme. And in 2015, um, I kind of reevaluated what I wanted to do in life and had a conversation with my mom one day. And she said, you ever think about doing real estate again? I want to slow down and, and transition towards retirement. And I said, probably not. I mean, I wasn't really interested in it. I had originally gotten my real estate license when I was in college because she had forced me to to help her take referrals on the other side of the island. I was going to college on the other side of the island, but uh, came home that same night and my wife said, "You know, will you ever think about doing real estate?" I saw an ad in the paper about the licensing classes, and I said, "Did you talk to my mom?" And she said, "No," but <laughs> you know, these are the two smartest influential ladies in my life. And I said, "You know what? I'll just go do the classes to reactivate my license, and we'll see what happens." Because I was taking some time off. I, I had a uh, 
ended the election cycle previously. I went to an army school, so I was just kind of reevaluating what I wanted to do. And so I just got, I, I reactivated my license and just started going to work. I mean, without a real clear plan and just showed up every day. And so as new agents, you know, they ask, what should I do to be successful? You just go to work every day. That's, that's it. Like, you know, a lot of agents will get their license and then treat it as a side hustle or kind of go to the beach when they don't have anything to do. And just from day one, I went to the office for eight hours a day. And I, if I didn't have anything to do client wise, I studied the contract. I figured out YouTube. I figured out how to send email campaigns. Like I did things to build the business that would benefit me later on in, 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 in my career, even though I didn't have a large database or I didn't have a lot going on. Yeah, that's how it started was, I mean, I kind of, you know, didn't have another plan. It wasn't like I had this grand scheme and this this blueprint of what I was going to do. I just started going to work every day. All right. So you get your license back in 15 and then you start working. So we didn't well, here's any- a, And here's an important piece to this is that when I was at this army school before I came home, I read the four hour work week and it's by Tim Ferriss. Oh. And there's a lot of weird stuff in that, but there was a piece in that book. And I always take like the one biggest thing, you know, when I read a book, I take the biggest takeaway away. And the biggest takeaway for me in that book was he says the, the, the worst thing that we teach our kids, the biggest American fallacy is do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Because the reality is most of the things that we love to do in life do not generate us income. You know, we're not professional basketball players. We're not professional surfers. You know, we don't, we don't necessarily own a restaurant if we like to cook. Spending time with our, our significant other or our kids does not generate us income. But those are the things we truly love to do. Right. And so what he says is, is that if you if you can find a thing that provides you the time and resources to do the things that you love, you will then become passionate about that thing and you'll become successful at it because it's just a means to an end. And that's how I started to think about real estate was like, was I passionate about doing real estate? Probably not. I mean, but after a year one and making 150 grand my first year, I was like, you know what, this is something that's going to provide me with the flexibility to spend time with my kids who are, who are little at the time and the resources to, to live a comfortable life. And so that made me passionate to excited to this day. It excites me to get up to go to work every day because that's the way I, I view it. So, so, you know, that's going to lead me to a couple of different questions. And one of them is, you know, you mean you don't love real estate? I mean, you don't live for real estate? You know, no, I mean, that's, that, that, that's not, I'm, I'm passionate about it and I'm, and I'm motivated to do it, but I can't say I love it. Like I love my kids or I love my wife or I love going to the beach on the weekends. You know, I mean, those are, it's a different type of love. I mean, do, so, so I, I think you really got to evaluate what do you truly love to do versus what do you need to do to do those things that you love to do. And so, um, you know, like I always, I always joke, like, I think it's so hokey when people put in their, their real estate bio that like, I, I, you know, I love to find people their dream homes. It's like, yeah, do you really? Like, I, mean, I don't know if that's like super true. I mean, maybe you do, but I think you like doing that to do because it feeds the things that you love to do. I think if you really evaluated it, you know, love is a strong word to me, you know? And, um, yeah, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. I mean, you know, yeah. here's, here's an interesting part about what you're talking about is a lot of people think that, you know, for me, I, okay, so I want to give you the example of me, right? So I took, it took me many, many years to figure out what I love to do. Right. I mean, I have the passion to do. I mean, I can do anything. Mm -hmm. I can find the passion to do anything. Right. But when I found the passion to do to get the time to do what I want to do and those things, my family, my family is always going to be number one. And as that moved, as as my girls got older, my both of my girls are in their 30s, families, the whole starting families themselves. And I get to see grandkids now rather than, you know, I can I can walk away from that. I went to saw my grandson last night was great. But the point I'm making is this. Now I know what I love to do aside from my family. I love to play golf. I not love to work on my own home. And I'm not talking about big construction projects. I love to do things around it, make it better all the time. Real estate and what I do in real estate with coaching and doing other things, I now have the ability to be passionate about my real estate because it makes me give me more time to play golf and to do the other things I love. So that is really cool. And everybody should take note of that. Where if you're passionate about something else, find a way to be able to do it more or to be with more people to do it. Make sense? And I think and I think you 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 probably coach to this all the time, Dave, is that the reality is I don't know anybody who actually loves the things that you have to do in real estate to be successful, right? Who loves driving a buyer around for three months and then they don't buy? Who loves going on tough listing appointments where the seller grills you? Like people, those are uncomfortable not fun things to do, right? Who loves doing the prospecting it takes? Who loves following up with people for two years before they actually buy? Like 
I don't know anybody who loves doing those things, but those are the things you got to do in order to be successful. So you almost have to do things you don't like to do, right? That, that's the most, to me, the most successful real estate agents are the ones who do the, the things that are uncomfortable, that, that nobody likes to do. And that's what makes them successful is you don't have to love those things, but you have to love the outcomes. Right, exactly. And, and that's going to go right into something we talked about earlier in the week was about your schedule, right? So yep. one of the things that I'm always working on with agents that I work with on a, on a daily and weekly basis is, you know, show me your schedule. Let's let's see what you're doing on your schedule, right? And it's not so much that everything needs to be so exciting about your schedule, but it needs to be to a point where it's exciting enough for you to go do it. And then it gives you that time to mm -hmm. do what you got to do, which makes our schedule boring to a point. Yes. And it should be, right? Talk to me about your schedule and how it works out for you. Yeah, I, I aim to have an extremely boring, predictable life. That is, to me, a successful week is when everything that I plan to do that week happens the way it should have happened and there was no surprises and nothing pops up and blows up my schedule. I can't say that I'm 100% successful at that because things happen in life. You can't avoid it. But in most cases, like I know what I'm going to be doing eight Mondays from today. I mean, the Monday, the Monday schedule is, is very set. It's sacred. It's full of meetings. Every Monday is we have a transaction meeting, an agent attraction meeting, a new agent meeting, a database meeting. Like we do things back to back to back on Monday, but the team understands that that's part of their routine is Mondays is our day to plan for our business for, for the rest of the week and touch base on the things that are important. Right. And so whatever you're doing throughout the week, I mean, you have to have those, those time. And I don't like time blocking. I like time prioritization. So if you commit to doing two hours of prospecting a day, five days a week and you miss one day, that means the next day you got to do four. It doesn't mean that that goes away because your schedule got blown up and you didn't have the opportunity. You still are committed to doing that thing. And it's just like exercise. If you commit to exercise five days a week and you miss a day, that means you got to do it two times a day for, you know, in, in the future or on the weekends. If you want to take the weekends off, you don't get Saturday off anymore. So um, you want boring predictability because that definitely the outcome is success. Yeah, what I what I what I always work on, I work I do work on time blocking. And after our conversation, I started giving that a lot of thought about time allocation, time time prioritization. But one of the things I like people to understand is I believe that time management is bullshit because you can't manage time. You can't stop and you can't say, "Wait, hold that minute." You can't yeah. rewind it, right? You, this is not a basketball game. This is not a movie. This is not anything on Netflix. You can't stop. But you, with the allocation and the prioritization. You can, you can kind of monetize it where you can make it work for you so that you make absolutely more money because you're, you're being careful with how you're spending it. So mm -hmm. the time monetization has two meanings. Number one, how you spend the time and how it, when you spend the time allocating it properly, you can absolutely make more money, therefore monetize. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. And even more important than that is, is, effort blocking, not time blocking. If you have a task that requires effort, if you if you block that into your schedule and you, it doesn't necessarily have to take two hours, it could take one hour, but now you've got that thing done. I, I think about this like from a content, we talked about social media content. People are always like, how do you, you know, put out so, so much social media content? It's just, I have a deliberate time block, but then it's an effort block. So I know I need to put out four videos on YouTube every, a, a week and I need to put out 20 short form videos on social media a month. And so I can do that in an hour or two. If I, if I just shoot all the content and, and, I, and I create everything, I can do that in an hour or two. So I just got to do that once a month, but it's an effort. It's an effort, not necessarily a time block. So I know it's just got to get done. Sometimes it maybe takes three hours because we're going to do something on, on scene or it's going to be a little bit more complicated. But I know at a minimum, if I just focus my effort for one to two hours, I can create enough content for an entire month, but I just got to focus on doing that, right? And so it's the outcome that matters, not necessarily the time that you put into it. Yeah. And the interesting part about what you're saying is that, you know, the content thing, people, people always say, well, well how am I going to get time to do it? How am I going to do this? Look, you and I've been doing content for a long time. I've been doing video for 15 years. So I have actually transitioned from doing, you know, off the cuff, off the top of my head stuff to actually writing down scripts. Yes. Tr uh, truth be told for a little bit of it, I you do use AI, but for most of it, it's coming out of here with different ideas. And so, so do you actually sit down, you, you create the, the, the script, you create what you're going to talk about, and then you just do all the videos all at once? Is that how you do it one day a month? Yeah, my process is, is really simple. I have a notes app on my phone and throughout the days, 
and do and when I do business, questions come up. Agents ask me questions, deals create questions, deals create issues. And I just take notes. And and after a couple of weeks, I have a ton of notes on things I can talk about. And so it's either agent advice or it's talking about something real estate related, some type of real estate of advice for our clients. And so I just let the market drive that. Like if in our normal course of business, like you don't really have to come up with any specific ideas because the the, the business is going to tell you what you need to answer. Right. So I, that, that's kind of my process is I just, I just take notes. And then once, once a month or once every two to three weeks, I'll probably sit down and shoot, you know, I'll just, I'll just take the whole, the whole list. And again, people overthink this. Yep. Wherever I'm at, I have yep. two, you know, what studio at my house, a studio at my in my office. I spent, you know, the, I spent the money to set that up, so it's nice and easy. It's comfortable. I don't have to think about it. It's just like hit record on my laptop, <clears> and everything's good to go. I don't care if I have the same shirt on for the for 17 videos. Nobody cares. Nobody you know, like you don't have to. Obviously, I don't have to change my hair, but it's like just create <laughs> it and then and then and then put it out there and don't overthink it because I think people put all these mental barriers in place. You know that that the. The lighting's not perfect or my, you know, I don't want to do the same shirt three times. It's like, never mind any of that stuff. Just do it. So, yeah, the interesting part about that is like, I was, I was per that person that carried five shirts and two sport jackets around with me <laughs> to change it. So it looked good. And now it's like, okay, am I still, I still do that a little bit. But when we talk about content, Dylan, since we're on that subject now, you know, content for me is like, okay. So the other day I know I'm going to be traveling a little bit and I want to make sure that all my content is done for two months. So, you know, my, 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 my assistant and I have been working on building what we have to do. And so one day uh, last week, I said, okay, so I need to do two sets of four video for two different accounts. So that's 16 videos. And I'm saying, okay, I'm going to do some on this. I'm going to do some on that. But you said, let the market drive your content. So what did I do? I had, I had you know, three top agents do more than 20 million a piece in my room at that time. And I said, guys, I need content from all of you. Well, then what do you mean, Dave? I said, what's the biggest thing in your way today? I got consistency. I got the market. I got all these things. So each comment gave me four videos. Yeah. So it's like really simple. If, you do, if you're not doing notes like you are, and, and I do that, and sometimes I forget about it, it's really simple because you let the market drive your content. And leads to another one. One of my favorite saying I saw recently with at your place right behind you to the other side, discipline equals freedom. You're talking about your schedule, Dylan, and you're talking about doing this video in one day. And you, you, you've actually, without, without even trying, you've planned all your content through your notes app on your phone. And Dylan, what's really cool is discipline equals freedom. And why is that cool to me? Because it actually allows you to lose that anxiety that we all feel from time to time. And because we're disciplining ourselves to do what we got to do to make sure that we can do our passion stuff. Talk to me about that saying and how you apply it. Yeah, I, I, I ripped that off from Jocko Willick. The, the book is Extreme Ownership. It's an amazing book on just leadership and mindset and the way Navy SEALs do what they do and how it applies to our business world. So if you need a book recommendation, definitely read that. But it just resonated with me because a lot of times people think discipline means less freedom or they think restriction, you know, they think of discipline in, in, the, in the sense of how we were, we're a kid and we have like, if we're in a really strict disciplined household, we don't have a lot of freedom, but that's really the wrong way to think about it. Because if you can apply this to everything in life, if you are disciplined, and this is one of my, my practices, I will exercise five days a week and intermittent fast very strictly for five days a week, the weekdays and on the weekends, I can have dessert. I can drink a couple beers. Like I don't feel any restriction on the weekends because I had the discipline in the first previous five days in order to allow me some freedom on the weekends. I think about discipline in your finances. If you're financially disciplined for 10 to 15 years, you can really live for the remaining 30, 40 years of your life very in, in freedom. You don't have to work anymore if you're really smart about the way that you are really disciplined about the way you handle your finances. If you're very disciplined about your time, I probably don't work more than six hours very often. Like I, I, I have a very disciplined six hour work block. I go to the office before eight and I'm usually leaving by 2.30 or three at the latest. And I don't work on the, in the evenings. I don't work on the weekends, but it's because I have very disciplined time and effort when, when I am working where I'm not messing around. If I'm at work, I'm actually working. I'm not scrolling Instagram. I'm not small talking with people in the office. And so if you're disciplined, you just have more freedom. And so if you think about life in that way and, and, and design your, your routines around that and your workflow around that, I think uh, 
it's it's a lot easier to to create the kind of outcomes you want. So I want to I want to take the the six hour work day. I want to take the discipline, and I want to talk about something that I've always seen in my in my career of owning a brokerage. I was with a uh, the brokerage that had a color gold. We won't talk about the name. It was Century Twenty One, but we won't talk about the name anyway. One of the things I noticed was that you would go to conventions, you'd go to events. Well, they only did conventions and one leadership thing. We do events all over the place, all all the time. And you would hear these big top producers, these big top co company owners talking about how they work eight hours a day and they have 85 assistants and they have this system and that system, but they never tell the, tell you A, how they got there and they never tell you anything about the system. And if you wanna to talk to them to ask them the questions, they will be very cursory with you. They won't give you a lot of information because they think they're giving something away. So all that being said, I wanna ask you how you got to the six hours mm -hmm. a, a day and how you did that, what you had to do to build your business as you moved forward. And how did you get to being, you know, your number three team in EXP in the country? That's pretty huge, man. It, it's amazing. It's mind blowing. But this is a great question. I love it because people, we do these talks and it's like, you see where you're at and you don't see where, how, what got you there. And I so, want to know that I want to know some yeah, details yeah. how you get there. We got great shit to talk well, the about. Way, the way I got to, and it's, completely related to discipline equals freedom is the way I got to six hour work days is I did 12 hour work days. And so in the beginning, the first two and a half, three years of building our team, I would, I was, a, I was producing, you know, 15, 20 million a year myself. And then I was also creating the resources and systems to build the team. So I was working double plus spending my own money in order to build the team and, and the processes and the resources. And so you don't get here by like, you know, I think people want to do a team and, you know, want to grow this big organization because they think it's like they're going to make all this money and it's going to be so easy and they can do less. Really, you work way more and spend way more money before you get to a point where it's profitable and you can work less. But that's what it was, was I was producing at a high level as a realtor, plus leading the team and building the resources and systems. But the systems is what is what it takes. And, and I want to tell people is you just got to pick one thing a week. And if you want to be able to scale your organization and you want people to do things the way that you do it, that's the things that you do that are successful. The only way to scale that is you have to write it down. That's the simple answer is you have to write everything down. And again, that takes time. It takes discipline to do that thing. But if you write a process down, if you list your, pro if you write your process down, very detailed in a standard operating procedure, now you can give that to a brand new agent. I get brand new agents that are sell 15 homes their first year out of the gate, not knowing anything and with very minimal guidance because we have videos, we have checklists, we have standard operating procedures, we have resources, we have templates. We've built all of these things that a brand new agent can take and not have to rebuild the wheel. They don't have to start from scratch, but you as the leader or the builder of this have to has to take the time to do that. And you have to have the discipline. Everybody says like, I don't have the time. I'm so busy. I'm selling 30 homes a year. And that's bullshit. Cool but you're never going to get beyond selling 30 homes a year if you don't figure right. out how to spend the time to scale yourself and to build the resources for other people. So that's the big one. And I'm, I literally have a, you know, a list of things if you want to get started, you know, on stuff that you need to start working on, because that's, that's the key to the game is you have to write everything down. So I want to, I want I want to hit a couple of things there. I want to get to writing it down, but I want to tell everybody, everybody that says I don't have the time. I could never do that. Time is so valuable. All this other stuff. Uh, I'm going to tell you all right now, you're all full of shit. It just means that you don't want to do it. When someone says they don't have the time, it means they don't want to do it. They're not making the time. They're not disciplining themselves. There's that word again to yep. get in that. The other thing that I want to make a point of is whether anybody agrees with this or not, I believe it works. It works for me. When we talk about writing things down, I mean using this and this. Here's why. Writing is the doing part of thinking. It allows you to really put it out on paper and put it out. Whether that's what you meant or not, it doesn't matter. My point is really simple. When you write stuff down, you're creating. You're, you're downloading from your head, and it actually is going to give you more room to create more and more and more. But building those systems, man, that is the most important thing there is. You yeah. know? Okay. So you start going through the business, you start building your business and you're building your systems that are working for you through writing stuff down. 
and then you you change you and, change companies. And let me con- let me comment on that. That's what's important. Yeah. Is it started with me, right? I didn't have this big vision to like build a, a hundred person sales team. I like the first system I built was a contract reference document. So when I first started 2015, I go to the office every day and I figured I better learn how to write a contract. And so I asked my mom for the last 10 contracts she wrote and I looked through all of them and then I started figuring out, okay, so in this paragraph, it's always 10 days. Cool, I can make a template that's 10 days for seller's disclosure every single time. And there's certain paragraphs that are variable. So it's like, oh, this is like, if it's financing, it's this, if it's cash, it's that. And so I created a Google Doc that had paragraph by paragraph, a, a cut in, you know, explanation or a reference to the term. And that has turned into actually something that like our state has adopted, our state organization has adopted that because that's something you can give a brand new agent that yep. they can now write a contract really well and a really high quality contract because you gave give them a reference. But I did that for me just so like, I could figure it out and I, and I and I wouldn't have to burden someone else or if I had to write a contract at 10 o'clock and I didn't have to call a broker. So it started with just the stuff I needed to be successful. And I, and then I recognized, hey, I can just give this to somebody else and then they can be successful and give it to 100 people and they can all be successful. And so it's got to start with you. A hundred percent. I mean, one of the things that, that, that I've done is I created I created videos on how to do a contract. So I mm-hmm. give that to all of the people I'm working with that are new agents. And it's like, if I've given it to a hundred people, only one has had a problem with it. And the only reason she had a problem with it because she didn't want to do it. So- I mean, that's the only reason everybody else, this is great, Dave. And they would go through the video. They could rewind it. So I had, a, I had an agent tell me one time my, my contract video was boring. And I'm like, hey, bro, it's not it's not for entertainment. It's for help you write a contract. <laughs> this, is not a, this is not for your entertainment value. <laughs> yeah, you're monotone. You're in the video. You're, it's just it's just really cool. All right. So there's a lot of things that you do. You're, you're a fantastic leader. As I said, you're the team leader, broker in charge of the agency team in Hawaii. And you, you lead in certain ways. And when you speak, it seems that people listen. I, I'm going to date myself. I don't know if you have anybody ever heard of E.F. Hutton. That's beside the point. It was a TV commercial 30, 40 years ago. Anyway, you talked about, I'm going to go through two different, um, two different videos you did. And one was Care Bear versus or Vampire. Talk to me about the premise. What's a Care Bear? What's a Vampire? Uh, and how is that good? How does that affect agents and what they should be doing? So the premise is, are you somebody people want to be around? And I, this applies to everything we do from, especially from a leadership standpoint. But even when you answer the phone, I tell you, just when you answer the phone, if it's a lead that's calling in, answer it with a smile, answer excited, answer like this person's about to write you a million dollar check, because they will feel your energy through your voice and through the phone. Versus if you answer the phone and think, oh my goodness, this is another person that's going to run me around and not going to actually buy anything and waste my time. They're going to feel that energy and they're not going to want to do business with you. So from a leadership standpoint, that's you just have to show up that way every day. I mean, like no matter what I got going on in life, no matter you know what kind of day it's been, if you walk into my office and want to talk to me, I'm going to be excited to see you. I'm going to be positive. I'm going to be uplifting. And I'm going to be somebody you want to be around. Like, I want you to come to me because you need a, you need a kick in the butt. You need some motivation. You need some, uh, you know, a, a reason to go out there and do a thing that you don't want to do. And so uh, that's just the way I think if, if it's a, and it's a practice, it's not something that you're born with, right? It's something you have to be, you have to be mentally conscious of every day is how are you showing up? What kind of energy are you putting out there? And I use the Care Bear, right? The Care Bears shoot positive love and energy out of their their, right. their chest to everybody else or vampires will bite you in the neck and suck the life out of you and and you know who those people are like you don't want to be a vampire you don't want to be the person that comes in the room and they're like oh my goodness dave is here again what is he going to ask me for is what kind of problems is he going to start yes. complaining about right you don't i mean and if you're that person and you don't have the self-awareness to understand that you're that person you're never gonna no one's ever gonna want to help you no one's ever gonna want to lead you <laughs> no one's ever gonna want to follow you <laughs> so you have to be extremely conscious of your energy yeah it's, it's 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 really important as a leader too to know how to work with those types of people as well or you don't work with them you say you know what yep. i choose i choose i think maybe you should go somewhere else i've had i've had coaching clients like that and people say oh man you got that person I say, yeah, they're going to be great. They're going to be fine because it's just like, I mean, look, patience is, is they always say patience is a virtue. Patience is very important along with being disciplined when, when you're working with people. I mean, that's one of the things that I know that you've been able to do and I've been able to do and move forward. So, okay. So here's another one, right? A lot of people believe, I'm going to tell a quick story about it before we get to the actual conversation about it is 
a lot of people think that they do business by referral, right? And I want to tell you what this this typically is for most real estate agents I talk to. I talked to a, a, a former coach and client the other day, and he started saying, well, I do a lot of referral business. And I said, well, how many deals will you do this year? He said, oh, six. I said, oh, okay, good, good. How are you doing business by referral? And and the answer was, well, you know, I, I this person came, I got this lead, and I did a great job for them, and, and they gave me their sister and stuff. To me, that's referral by accident, right? Because you, you're actually doing a good job. No question there. But you're doing referral by accident. Could you imagine? This is what I say to those agents is, could you imagine? And this, you, all you out there listening to this know what I'm talking about. Could you imagine if you actually treated the people you already knew like that? What would happen? And that comes from that thought process. comes from another video of yours I saw that, that you got to do deals to get deals. Deals yep. have babies. So give yep. me an explanation. Talk about that and expand on what I was talking about just now. So this this came from when I first got started as a brand new agent in the cubicle next to me. It was, an, it was a longtime agent that was about to retire. And she had a ton of business in the south part of our island, very low dollar, you know, $30,000 lots, $15,000 lots that, that she needed to offload. She had like 25 listings. She needed to offload what, when she retired and nobody in the office wanted to do it because they were too good to go and work, you know, drive an hour to go sell a $30,000 lot. And I said, Ann, I will take all of them. Give, give them all to me. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take care of all of them for you. And I did that. And so like year one, I did like 20 transactions just off of these little tiny, you know, I probably did like 4 million in volume, but it was like 20 transactions. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I did a ton of deals and one, it gave me a ton of experience. But two, it turned into a ton of referrals, right? Because I did those deals, they had babies. And then the next year, I got 20 more deals out of all of those deals. And so I, I, I tell agents all the time, never mind figuring out, you know, how, how am I going to sell that million dollar house or worrying about sales volume? I'd rather you worry about units and just do as many transactions as you can possibly do or be involved in as many transactions as you can be involved in. Help somebody be a transaction coordinator. Help somebody be a showing assistant, even if you don't get paid very much because just the momentum of doing deals, even if it doesn't directly come out of that deal as a referral, creates more deals. It's just gravity, it's a law of nature. And so you just wanna do as many units as you possibly can, never mind the split, never mind the referral fee. You know, we have amazing programs amongst our team that the the the, the splits are not great because we're, we're paying a referral fee and you're paying a team split. But if the agent can do 10 or 15 deals their first year, their rocket shipped up and by your, one, of my, one of my biggest problems now is my rock star brand new agents who do 10 or 15 deals their first couple of years from our lead programs in year three have so much of their own business that they don't really need to take team leads anymore and so i'm like man you but you're like my best converter <laughs> you know so it's like right, but right. the only way you get to the point of doing your own business is you got to do business and and if you have no sphere or you don't have a way to lead generate you just have to figure out get access to somebody who does and that can totally rocket ship your career and create a sustainable business going forward. Well, Dylan, that's, that's the whole thing about, you know, if you get it, like you're Zillow flex, right. But you, you're not giving those to new agents. I mean, we have, we have what we call pond. Leads, I do. I, right? I love it. Z- I, Z- I love Zillow flex. I think that's a, I think that's a, that's a mindset shift that a lot of people need to, right. um, yeah, here's the, but we have, but we have really good training. We have really good resources, re- a, a ton of engagement for, for supervision and, I have, I mean, that's, that's a primary lead source for brand new agencies is I call it paid training. Like, you know, you get out there and you, you get to train, be in the car, doing the job. The only way you learn the business is to do the business. You're never going to learn it in a classroom or, or behind a computer screen. You have to be out there on the road, going on appointments, talking to clients, and then you'll learn it. The, the business will educate you. So I love Zillow for, for brand new agents. So one of the things I wanted to say with that is that that one Zillow lead that you actually convert could lead to anywhere from two to six other deals, maybe more, depending on the life of that and the life, the lifetime of that client. So that's so, so very important when when that's happening. I mean, is to do those deals, do a really great job on them. And then remember that you actually know a lot of people. So if you're that nice to them, you might get the same way. So over the last year, there's been a lot of stuff going on in our business and it's going to change. Every state in the United States has a different process for working with buyers and sellers in New Jersey up until 99 we didn't have any agency so it was it was the wild wild west east whatever you want to call it and then we started worrying about buyer agents and seller agents 
disclosed dual agents and transaction agents. That's New Jersey. Talk to me about what's going on, how NAR is, is relating to you and your business and what you're doing for that eventual change that we know is coming and how we're going to do business come August. It's a big change for us. We, we, uh, we always had buyer representation agreements available to us. I would say less than 5% of agents actually used them. So it was a standard business practice just to be a buyer's agent, go show people around and not have any contractual agreement with them. So there's a lot of fear and apprehension in our market about how do we go about doing this? And so I've been putting a lot of time and energy into training around it and preparing our team for the upcoming changes when, when there, it is going to be required. But what I'm finding is, which is very interesting, this is great about having a, a team is the, the senior agents, the experienced ones are having way more brain damage about this than the brand new agents. The brand new agents, you know, since October, November last year, when this was, this was coming, any brand new agents got onboarded. We just train them that this is what you do. Part of the process is you get a buyer's rep agreement signed and they're doing it and they're doing it at 3%. And so even if they're the sellers offering less, which the sellers are still offering commissions in the vast majority of cases, 99 plus percent of the time, they're getting the additional piece of the commission because they've done a good job in presenting the, the buyer's rep agreement to them. And our, the short story here, and I know you got a, a giveaway that you're gonna put in the comments, but the short story with buyer's rep agreements, and I think it's the easiest way to get over the fear and apprehension of it is you have to focus on a process. It's not, you don't lead with compensation. And I think that's what a lot of agents think is I got to immediately say, Dave, here, you got to sign this agreement and you're going to pay me 3%. If you lead with that, you're going to get a, a ton of objections and you're going to lose a lot of the time. So what you want to start with is a, a very thorough discovery process. You know, what are your hopes and your dreams, Dave? I got to get to know exactly what you want to do. Why are you looking at property here on the big island? And we have two pages of questions that you can ask to build that 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 uh consultation process then you got to have a value proposition you have to clearly articulate why you should work with me and my team because if there's no perception of value and why how we're different and how we're going to do a great job for you you're not going to want to pay for it and then after those two things are done now we have the conversation about compensation but the most important piece about that is framing the outcome and this is an important thing in any difficult or uncomfortable conversation is you have to frame the conversation in terms of most most likely outcomes because if you don't people will make assumptions they'll jump to conclusions and then you're going to get a ton of crazy objections so the way that we handle this is we lead with in the vast majority of cases sellers will pay for our compensation i believe that's going to be the case going forward i believe good listing agents will continue to articulate why sellers should do that so no matter what happens in august in the vast majority of cases, and we'll, we'll have market data to pack this up when the time comes. Like right now, if you look in your market, how many sellers are offering 0% commission? It's probably in the single digit percentages of all yes. the listings in your MLS, right? Yes. And so in the vast majority of cases, right? 95, 98, 99% of the time, the seller's offering my compensation. You don't have to worry about it, Dave, no problem. You know, it's not gonna cost you anything out of pocket. In very few cases, they may not be, but we're gonna do a couple of things for you before that becomes the case. We're going to either negotiate it into the offer in terms of a concession credit to you, which then will cover your compensation, or we can factor it into the sales price. So your overall net cost of the home is going to be the same, regardless if you pay for it or the seller pays for it, because we're off, we're, we're negotiating it into the sales price. And if in the very, very rare case, and you will know upfront, and I'll be very transparent about it, that none of these things are available to us, you may have to pay for our compensation at closing as part of your closing costs but you're going to be 100% clear on that. It's not going to be a surprise. You will know that before you make an offer. We will provide you a net sheet so you know what your closing costs are going to be. And if you're com comfortable with that, then we'll move forward with an offer. And if you're not, we won't. So are you comfortable with that, Dave? Right? And now I've framed the whole conversation and showed you that it's almost it's so unlikely that you're going to have to come out of pocket, that you're going to be comfortable committing to it. And then there's no problem. You know, because we frame the conversation properly, but always think about, am I framing the conversation in a way that starts from the end and then works our way back, right? Most likely outcome. And then if that doesn't happen, what are the other options before? Because if we lead with the most unlikely outcome that you will have to come out of pocket, you're going to object all day long. So in other words, what you're doing, so so I'm going to go to the listing side really quickly to use it yep. as an example is is one of the things that i always talk about is i give an agent say okay so we're learning our listing presentation right 
I'm going to give you two choices. You can go to the to the presentation and say, okay, this is the price that I've come up with for the house and then go through the comps. Or you can go through the comps and talk about how you arrived at the price. Yep. And you're giving them that price with a net sheet. I want to get in that too, right? Mm -hmm. This way, what you're doing is you're giving the price, quote unquote, at the end of the buyer presentation, after you framed everything that could happen and put it all into perspective, and then you're giving a net sheet for the buyer. Now, truth be told, I think 50 to 70% of the agents are scared shitless of doing net sheets for their sellers because they don't want to show them that, oh, you're getting 15,000 or whatever you're getting, plus yep. all the other stuff, right? Talk to me about, is, is that correct? And talk to me about the net sheet for the buyer. Yeah, I think a buyer needs to understand, right? At the end of the day, there's going to be closing costs. There's going to be appraisal costs. There's going to be home inspection costs. There's going to be title and escrow fees. There's going to be all of these things. And potentially one of your closing costs could be commissions. I'm going to do my best to negotiate that and other costs. If you need a credit for to buy down your interest rate or a credit to pay for the appraisal, we can, we can negotiate all those things. But that's what I'm good at. I do this all day long. I do this for hundreds of families every year. This is why... I'm going to save you money. I'm going to provide you with value, right? So showing them that, hey, this could be the worst The mm -hmm. worst case scenario is this, but I'm going to 95% of the time that we never get there and you don't have to worry about it because I do all of these things. And that way it puts their mind at ease and they don't have to worry about, I'm going to have to come up with an extra 20 grand to pay you because most, and here's one more perspective on this, Go ahead. which I've been really hammering with agents on it, is do the market analysis in your market. I ask agents this all the time and they don't know the answer, right? How many transactions happen in your market that are low or no down payment loan transactions, right? Where the buyer has no additional cash. And so go do that. I know in my market, it's 12%. So 12% of the time, it's a USDA, VA, FHA loan, some kind of low down payment program. So 88% of the time, it is either cash or a conventional financed transaction. These buyers can afford compensation, right? These buyers are financially stable. They, they're going to, if we provide value, they're going to understand the value of pain if they have to. So we're worrying about a, ver a fraction of the business. The 12% we're going to have to deal with. Those are the ones we're going to have to negotiate hard for. Sellers are going to have to understand if they want to do, do a deal with those folks. They're going to have to come up with some concession. They're going to have to come up right. with a concession, right? Or credit. And, yep. and so that's another thing is I tell agents, don't assume none of your buyers can pay for your compensation. That is a wrong assumption. 80% of the time, they absolutely can. A savvy cash buyer who's going to pay a million bucks for a house in cash, they pay for professional advice all the time. This is what they do. They didn't get a million bucks in cash because they were cheap and they don't have a financial advisor and they don't have a tax guy and they don't have uh, you know, attorneys that they pay for advice. They will pay you. You just have to provide your value proposition to make sure that they clearly understand what you're going to do for them. What's the reason in Asia will have trouble doing this? Guts? Just, well, it's in mindset. Preparation? Mindset? It's preparation. Definitely practice. Um, you don't, I always say, don't practice on your clients. <laughs> the worst right. thing you can do is practice on your clients. Right. I don't think there's any reason why you can't do it. Here's another great way uh, that, that I've seen, that I've learned from, from brand new agents is when they have the 3% buyer's rep signed and the seller's offering two and a half, they say, hey, Dave, good news. You only got to pay a half percent. The buyer's going to cover the other two and a half percent. And the buyer's like, really? Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> And they get the additional half percent because it's framing, right? You framed it as good news. You didn't frame it as, well, Dave, uh, you know, I really hate to bring this up with you, but, you know, the seller's only offering two and a half. So you're going to have to pay another half percent. Are you that okay is with so that? That's so cool. That is, that, I mean, that's so <laughs> simple, Dylan. I mean, shit. I mean, think about this, right? I mean, it's, it, you, it, it's, it's a lot easier than everybody thinks it's going to be. And um, what do you think about when it, when it comes to this, the buyer representation things and everything we've got to go through and the changes we're going to make, which I think is good for our business, good for our industry. Is there going to be a percentage of people trying to get around this? Do you think there's, there's, you think this is going to thin out our, 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 uh, our membership at all, as far as NARS concerned? I think so because the, the people who don't want to be professionals and don't want to be, create mastery around this are going to have difficulty. And my biggest fear for, for agents is the individual agent. Um, you know, we've, we've been going towards the team model for a long time. And there's a lot of people that have like a bad attitude towards the team model, but I'm just going to tell individual agents right now, if you're an individual agent and you're competing against one of the agents on our team, your value proposition versus ours is going to be so night and day worse that it's going to be very hard for you to win. And, and I say this because as a team, 
we lead with the team value proposition. So Dave, if you're going to work with me to buy property in the state of Hawaii, I can show you property anywhere in the state within two, two hours, anywhere. You want to see property on Kauai, we can do that. Maui, we can do that. And not only can we do that, but I have a professional in that market that is an expert in the type of property you want to buy. You want to buy short-term vacation rental? We got somebody for you. You want to buy a farm and land property? We got somebody for you. We got, you want to buy a vacant land uh, lot that you can build on? We got somebody for you that. So by you working with us, you're not just working with me and my abilities. You're working with our entire team. If you want to see property on the weekends and I'm not available, I'm going to have one of my teammates. We're going to service you no matter, no matter what time of day it is, what, th what day of the week it is. We have six experienced brokers who can help you solve problems. They've seen everything under the sun in terms of Hawaii real estate. I mean, I have a list of, of the value proposition is ridiculous. And if, so if you compare that to an individual agent who you know, may have been in the business a year or two, a smart buyer who's interviewing for representation, I mean, the contract is going to be night and day. So that's really the two things you got to, you got to create mastery around having the conversation about buyer, about representation, but two, you got to have a large value proposition and being on a team, I think provides you with that at a scale, which is much greater than whatever you can provide on your own. I want to, I want to have a light bulb go off in the ones that aren't with teams and you're, you actually are a member of a team. If you didn't know this already, shame on you, your brokerage, that's what these teams are. Teams are brokerages within brokerages, plain and simple. If your brokerage is not supporting you in the manner that the team leader will support the members of the team, you got to go somewhere else. You're on the you wrong team. A, if you want to be a solo agent, that's great. But you still have the brokerage that you've got to be responsible to. Mm -hmm. If you're getting 100% commission, God bless you. You really are out all by yourself. That is just the way I look at teams today because I had a brokerage. I know what I tried to do with the brokerage. I tried to do everything all these great teams, including you are doing. I wasn't able to get the buy-in because, oh no, I'm good. I can do it on my own. Uh, I just want more money. Okay. What are you going to do with that money? And people would leave to go to these 80, 80%, 90% brokerages and I would never say it to them because I thought it, was, it wasn't it was right. It was nasty. I'd say, well, 90%, 100% of the deals you're doing, which is zero, is still zero. Zero. Right? <laughs> With a team, there's just, I mean, look, there's just so much support. It's what brokerages should be. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get my, off my soapbox there. Here we are. We talked about a lot of different stuff. The buyer compensation situation is, is very, very important. When, you're, when, when you've got new agents coming in to your team, Dylan, what are what should be their priorities as they get started and agents that are falling off a little bit with production that kind of lost a little bit we're in a we're in a mar we're in markets that are so different than any agent any uh regular agent that's been in a market in a business for 10 15 years has seen or a new agent trying to get into this market and the agents that became agents during covid really were order takers so yep. what would be, that's a lot I just gave you, yep, but yep. what would be the priorities for those people to get restarted and energized and start? Just focus, just refocus and, and engage as much. This is the, again, if you don't have an, a, a, an opportunity to engage because you don't have a, a, a brokerage who is cr providing with training, providing role playing, providing resources, then that's going to be difficult. But one of our goals as an operation is we have tons of engagement, literally five days a week. There's something that you can attend on a team level. There's additional stuff on the state resource level. There's national trainings that happen all the time. So there's no reason that you're not engaged with doing something because it's when you're at home with your head in the sand, you know, being depressed, if you're doing nothing, then nothing is going to happen. And so part of it is just creating momentum by being engaged. The other thing I'm extremely focused on right now and it's related to buyer's rep but anybody can do this even a brand new agent is you have to create a web presence a social media presence that creates clients in the marketplace that you don't know exist and so this is such a uh, people are missing this i mean there, there, there's such a lack of engagement online where like you you found me online dave like is there any doubt that you, I'm a credible person that knows more about Hawaii real estate and leading a team than anybody in the world? I mean, like I've created a persona online that you have no doubt. If you're an agent that needs leadership, you know who I am. You know, you, you, you've sampled everything I have to put out there in the universe. It's already there. It's very easy for me to, to recruit you as an agent because I don't have to really sell you on anything. The same is true of, of clients. I have, I've been doing YouTube for years. If you look for 
expert real estate advice online, you will find me and I don't have to convert you. I don't have to have a great value proposition conversation because you already had it with me online. And so even if you're brand new and you haven't even done one deal, if you're putting content out, talking about different parts of the, the, the contract, talking about market reports, neighborhood tours, if you're creating a persona of expertise, it's going to make your life a lot easier. And then clients will start coming to you and you don't have to prove yourself. So the, the, the internet is your resume. And if you don't have your resume online, how can you expect somebody to trust you with one of the largest purchases in their life? So focus on that. If you're brand new or if you just need to get restarted and things are slow, great news is you have the time. Start creating some content to convince folks online that you're the person they should work with. Look, I want everybody to understand that if you're out there, if you're if you're doing if you're doing prospecting, you're out there doing active phone prospecting, whatever kind of prospecting you may be doing, social media is going to support and validate who you really are. So I want to give you a couple of quick tips. If you don't have who you are in your profile or your bio, you're an idiot. <laughs> you need to be you need to be having the information that you are in real estate, your contact information, those kinds of things. Do not be a secret agent. And I see that all the time. And one other thing that I've, that I've heard a lot this past week calling agents is their voicemail. How about saying that what your name is and what you do? I mean, if you're not putting that on your phone, I mean, what are you trying to be secret? You don't want people to call you? I get a kick out of for sale by owner sometimes. They say, well, I'm on the do not call list. Oh, okay. So you don't want buyers to call you? Anyway, that's a side. <laughs> hey man, this is this has been a lot of fun. This has been fantastic. I hope you know whether people watch this live or have the recording to see it later. I sure hope they get some value from us. I got two things left for you, man. Uh, the first one is a question. First of all, um, first there's a question. How do I help you grow your business? Be available to me when I need you. I'm there, man. That's it. You know, I mean, if you want to help somebody, people know they can always call me, and I, I'll make this offer to everybody who's watching. You can. Look me up, quote a broker. You can book a meeting with me. I will, I will do, you know, I will spend 30 minutes with anybody to help them do a coaching session, just advice, pick, pick my brain. You know, I'm, I'm obligated. So many people have helped me get here that I'm obligated to give back. And that's why I love making connections with people like you, Dave, because, you know, if I come up with something and I'm like, hey, I should ask Dave about this. All you got to do is be available to me. And that's, that's more valuable than anything else. This is, is so cool. So a couple of quick things uh, before I end. Number one, I did find you online. I saw you in a, uh, in a, in a mastermind real quick talking about this buyer um, compensation issue. Um, and you know what? I mean, you just got to be out there and, and doing the business and, and, and being visible and be available, like you said. Um, and the other thing that's extremely cool um, is uh, you have my favorite numbers in your website and it's your area code, which is 808. Um, as a date, that's probably the best date in the world. It's my birthday. So anyway, oh, so, <laughs> so that's really cool. I, I love to see, I just noticed that I, everybody, look, I'm going to be giving out, uh, I'm going to be sending out the script that Dylan was talking about, about framing the conversation. So if you're interested in that script, please feel free to DM me. Uh, if you're on my list, you're going to be, you're going to be getting a link for that. Um, and if you want that, just, just give me a call or however you want to reach me, I'll be sending that out to everybody. Um, last but not least, man, I know you saw that when you were on that thing that I saw you talking to other people, you found out there was a hat involved to being on the broadcast. And here's the hat. It's coming out to you, man. Uh, anything else uh, from you, Dylan, that you want to, want, to, want to talk about? Thanks for having me, Dave. No, and if I can help with it, anybody, feel free to reach out. Awesome, man. God bless everybody and have a great, great weekend.